If you were a general and you had to encourage your soldiers on the night of the biggest battle of the war, the battle that would determine the outcome of the war, what would you say to them? I've never served in the armed services and I really appreciate those who have. And I can't imagine what it must be like that night before this big battle. What would you say? Maybe you would say something like Winston Churchill said in his most famous speech. And, and this is a portion of that speech. What General Weigand called the Battle of France is over. I expect that the Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends our British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. The whole theory and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be free and the life of the world may move forward into broad, sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known or cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted science. Let us therefore brace ourselves to the duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will say this was their finest hour. And those last words are the most memorable words. This was their finest hour. Our text brings us to a point where Jesus is about to go into battle that Jesus is going to go down to Jerusalem to suffer and to die and to save mankind. This was the moment in history that, that would change the outcome of the world. This is the, the time that was waited for from Adam and Eve by every believer since. This was the, the time that the prophets spoke about and longed for. This was Jesus' finest hour. And this event of transfiguration was God's pep talk for Jesus as he looked towards this moment that he would have to suffer and die. He gave Jesus a chance to see a glimpse of glory before his passion. And that's what we want to look at this morning. And we want to see what that meant for Jesus first, but then we want to see what it means for us as well. A glimpse of glory in the face of before his passion. So the disciples were on the mountain with Jesus. He went up to that mountain to pray and they were kind of sleepy and all of a sudden they woke up and they, they, they saw Jesus but he, it, he didn't look like the Jesus they had left on the mountain to pray. His face shone like the sun and his robes were white as like lightning and Moses was there and Elijah was there and this obviously made a tremendous impression on Peter because he talks about this in his epistle lesson. He said, we did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For we received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from that majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on that sacred mountain. So the disciples looked and they saw the glory of God in the face of Jesus. But can we also see the humanity of Christ in this story? The story begins with a time stamp. It says about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, James, John, and James with him and went up to the mountain to pray. Eight days after what? Eight days after Jesus had asked his disciples a question, who do people say that I am? And then he narrowed that question. He said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus gave him an A plus for his answer. And then Jesus began to speak about his suffering and death in Jerusalem and how he would be handed over to the leaders of the Jews and the chief priests and be crucified. And Peter began to say, no, Lord, this can never happen to you. And Peter failed that quiz. And, but this was, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. 
Satan was using Peter at this moment to tempt Jesus to give up his mission, to give up his suffering and death. And this isn't the first time or the last time that Jesus would be tempted to give up his mission. In the wilderness when he was tempted by the devil three times, give up your mission for the sake of a loaf of bread. Or when Jesus was hanging on the cross, the enemies of Jesus said, if you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Give up your mission. If you're the son of God, you shouldn't have to suffer like this. And these were the things that Jesus faced. I want you to imagine just for a moment, and maybe some of you can really imagine this well because it's happened to you, that a doctor says you have to have an operation. Let's say you've got a tumor on your colon, and so in two weeks there's going to be this major surgery to remove that tumor, and you don't know how it's going to turn out. Wouldn't you every morning and every night and all through the day pray and pray and pray that God would deliver you from this? And that's what Jesus did too. I, I, I want, what, what he experienced was a thousand times, a million times, a trillion times worse than anything we could imagine. The writer to the Hebrews says, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who would save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. And we know that happened in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he prayed so hard that it was like sweat, uh, drops of blood dripping to the ground from his face. And, and he prayed on this mountain, too, and no doubt he was praying about the same thing, and he prayed often about this. Because remember, in his humanity, he wouldn't be spared the pain. And he would have to undergo something so awful that we can't even begin to imagine. And so here on this mountain, God comes and gives him a pep talk. God comes to him and shows him his glory for an instant so he could remember always who he was. And we're told that he said, this is my son whom I've chosen, listen to him. Matthew, Mark, and Luke record this somewhat differently. And we shouldn't think that one of them made a mistake, but God spoke all of these words. Matthew, Mark, and, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or I'm sorry, Matthew and Mark uh, decided to say, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. And Jesus would remember those words. When he was on that cross, and God had to punish him for the sins of the world. He still cried out, my father, forgive them. And he cried out, father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Jesus did not waver. He did not doubt. This was his finest hour. Luke says that, G that God said, his father said, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. That's a phrase that's often used in Isaiah. Chosen for what? Chosen to be the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. Chosen to be the only one who could save mankind. Chosen to be the atoning sacrifice, the sacrifice that would fully pay for every sin that was ever committed. It's as if the father wrapped his arms around Jesus' shoulder and said, Son, there's no one else who can do this. There's no one else who can accomplish this. I've chosen you to do this. And what was Jesus' response? The writer to the Hebrews tells us, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And when... The glory was gone, and there was just Jesus. They went down and headed toward Jerusalem. This would be Jesus' finest hour. What does it mean for us to see God's glory in the face of Jesus on the mountain before his passion? The disciples were there on the mountain with him, Peter, James, and John. He took three witnesses who would see what, would hap what happened that day. And we're told that they were sleepy and that they woke up to see this tremendous sight of Moses and Elijah and Jesus and his glory. It's not the first time or the last time that they would fall asleep. Remember what happened with them in the Garden of Gethsemane? 
And Jesus went off to pray, and they fell asleep, and he came back and woke them up, and they fell asleep again, and the third time he didn't even bother waking them. But Jesus said to them at that time, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And in their new man, they, they want to listen to everything Jesus says. We all want to listen to Jesus. We want to pay attention to our spiritual life. There's always time for prayer in our lives, but in our sinful nature, well, God's word's not that important. In our sinful nature, prayer is a waste of time, or at least we think other things are more important. I grew up on a dairy farm, and some of you probably did too, and maybe you can appreciate this, but Sunday mornings were always a rush. And we would milk about 45 or 50 cows, and we, we were all involved, and we, we had to do the chores, and we had to clean up afterwards, and my dad was like the last one in the house because he, even in the dead of winter, had to take the manure away and come back in that freezing cold, and he would rush and get ready for church, and we'd be the last one practically through the door, and the church was nice and warm and toasty, and then as the sermon is starting to drag on a little bit, and his eyelids are fluttering and closing and he would wake himself up and they would flutter and close and he'd pop a mint into his mouth and they would flutter and close and on the way home he would he would absolutely chastise himself in front of us that, that he couldn't stay awake he, in his new man he loved the word of God it was precious to him the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak Lord it's good for us to be here Peter said and he was speaking according to his new man. And when he re remembered that moment, again, these words from Second Peter, we didn't follow cleverly invented stories when we told about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ when we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came from the majestic glory. You see it just so fresh in the mind of Peter that 20, 30 years later when he wrote these words, saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from the mountain when we were with him on that sacred mountain. And then when, when Peter was, when, when Peter, James, and John were, were with Jesus and the glory was gone, and, and, and Peter said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tents. And it says he was talking foolishly. But he was speaking from his new man. He wanted to savor that moment. He wanted to be with Jesus. He wanted to listen to God's son. Friends, savor the moment. For Peter, this was a Kodak moment, or a Snapchat moment, or a Facebook moment. It's a moment you, he wanted to save, a moment he wanted to savor. And have you ever had one of those moments? I think I have one of those moments almost every single day. As I'm reading the Bible or studying a portion of God's word, and, and God speaks to me, and he shows me his glory in the face of Jesus. There is no other God like this God that, that's revealed to us on the sacred mountain. What other God would come down from heaven to save me, to save us? What other God would come down and, and take the punishment for my sins so that he could say, your sins are forgiven? What other God would endure such suffering so that I could have a God that is, is familiar with suffering and knows what it's like and who can understand my weaknesses and help me in my times of trouble in this life. There's no other God like this. Friends, it's good for us to be here. This morning, it's good for us to be here. And in our devotional lives, in our prayer lives, it's, it's good for us to be here. We, we begin that journey for Lent. I think this is going to be the first year in many, many years that I have 16 sermons to preach in seven weeks. And I'm going to treasure every moment of it. And I hope you do too. On Sunday mornings, we will go to Genesis chapter 3 where it all began, where sin was planted in the garden and where God provided the solution for that sin. <clears throat> On our Wednesday, Ash Wednesday and then Thursday services, we're going to look at at the Lord's Prayer and, and how Jesus' passion helps us to understand that Lord's Prayer better. It's good for us to be here, to see God's glory in the face of Jesus. Amen. Let's pray.
Lord Jesus, for a moment here today, you again let us see your glory in the face, God's glory in your face. And we pray that we would see it not only in the story this morning, but especially in the stories of your suffering, your death, and your resurrection. It's so good for us to be here, dear Jesus. Amen. <laughs>